mind of God. Yet, as they continued to sing, they started to hear each other. They came to deeper understandings, and their music increased in unison and harmony. Then God called them together and revealed a mighty theme, far beyond anything that he had yet revealed. And he told them to bring to this new song their own thoughts and devices, but to do so in harmony. As they sang, he listened to their song, a sound of interchanging melodies woven together in a way that it passed beyond hearing, filling the places of creation, overflowing into the void. But as with many stories of creation, this beautiful music caught the ear of a malignant force, an angel named Melkor. Through his meddling, the music faltered, falling into disharmony, and soon it ended. God stepped in and rebuked Melkor. He then showed the angels a new world, a globe in the void, which they had created with their song. This world contained not only their offerings of song, but also so much more that God had added to their harmonies. Together, the angels and God had sung into life an entire amazing world. In these three stories, art, poetry, and song portray the creation of our world where the life-giving force of God imbues everything that is created. This world is full of beauty and balance wherever our actions have not spoiled it. When we listen to nature speak, we find new ways to discern the divine presence in what we previously may have seen only dimly. American poet Gary Snyder wrote, this living, flowing land is all there is forever. We are it, it sings through us. Let us listen for that song. I'd like to close with a poem by Thomas Merton. In the forest at night, cherished by this wonderful, unintelligible, perfectly innocent speech, the most comforting speech in the world, the talk of the rains making by itself all over the ridges, and the talk of the water courses everywhere in the hollows. Nobody started it. Nobody is going to stop it. It will talk as long as it wants the rain. As long as it talks, I am going to listen. Amen. If you could see what I see, it would warm your heart. If you could see what I see, it might even make you believe in God. If you could see what I see, that is, if you could see you, an old church acting like a young church, a sanctuary chock full of the most interesting, kind-hearted people in the world, if you could see what I see, you'd be smiling now, you'd be happy now. It's a beautiful sight from here. Now, if you are new here and passing through, you should know this. We are about to do something together, something big and bold, something important and full of sacrifice and full of joy and deep with meaning. You see, this church has democratized generosity. A church's ministries are fueled and powered by its friends and members, near and far, rich and poor. We practice radical generosity because we can do more together than any of us can do on our own. Because as Jesus said, it is in giving that we ourselves receive. Because the world out there needs more kindness, more truth, more peace, more mercy, more love for the stranger and help for the struggling. Your financial gifts ensure that our doors are wide open and that our children are nurtured in strong and supple faith, that we stand alongside the poor and the oppressed, and that we work for God's justice and wage Christ's peace, make music and worship and praise the living God. 
your gifts are the living embodiment of faithful belonging to God and to one another. This morning's offering will now be given and received.
Holy God, all that we are and all that we have come from you. And we return this portion to you that it be blessed and multiplied throughout the world to do your will. In Jesus' name. Now let us join together in our closing hymn, number 473, Blessed Assurance. And now, as we go from this place refreshed and renewed, let us go in a spirit of hope and a spirit of peace, praising our Savior all the day long. And let the whole church say,